Welcome to Inspirational Leadership. My name is Kristen Harcourt and I'm your host. I'm an executive coach and professional speaker. And I created this podcast to talk to progressive CEOs, strategic HR leaders, and forward thinking experts who are passionate about leadership development and creating positive work cultures. And today I'm very blessed to talk to my dear friend, Jane Watson. Jane Watson, Jane has so much to contribute to this conversation. She really, really cares about what it looks like to humanize the workplace. And sometimes that means having some really courageous conversations and taking some accountability for some of our behaviors and how each of us might be contributing to those. Uh, so a little bit about Jane. Jane is the senior director of a people partner at Click and she's the founder of the Aperta Project. She's also a speaker, a writer, a wonderful blog, a wonderful blogger at Talent Vanguard. Welcome to the show, Jane. Thanks, Kristen. It's so great to be here and chat with you about this topic. So Jane, as a starting point, I want to recognize that today is April 24th and currently we are experiencing a global pandemic. And uh, I, I know I've been really cognizant with my guests to, um, for each of us to share vulnerably around what we're experiencing. So um, how are you feeling over the last five to six weeks? What's been going on in your world? Yeah, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, as I'm sure is the case for most people. Um, so we moved to remote work pretty quickly and quite early at Click, and it happened, it happened fast. So we have a thousand employees in uh, Canada mostly and also in the US. And essentially within a few days, we decided to make the move to remote work. So my team and I were super busy and really intently focused on supporting the organization through that. And so that sense of being useful and, and being busy and really having a clear short-term purpose was wonderful. And, and as that closed off, it, it really kind of settled in. So there was a couple of, couple of tough weeks in there, but I think um, I feel lucky to be, to be working, to be comfortable at home and, um, and safe and healthy, really. Yeah, yeah, I know. I think it's, uh, it, it's important for us to take some time every day to see what we do have to be grateful for, even if they're the small little moments, right? I, I have to say, when I see the sun shining these days, I get super excited <laughs> because just seeing the sun, okay, every day the sun comes up, the sun goes down. That's consistent. That's something I can count on. <laughs> right. Hang on to those things right now. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Um, so, Jane, you have a lot of experience when it comes to remote work, and I, I think it's something that would be helpful for anyone that's listening right now. And, and to be honest, this isn't just about what's happening right now. Um, I think right now people are, are, there is remote work happening, but it's really important for us to be aware that this isn't a normal remote, remote work situation, right? Some people are not set up for remote work. A lot of people have, have kids. They have they could have elder people that they're taking care of. They have a lot of multiple responsibilities, perhaps, while they're doing remote work. Having said that, um, you know a lot about this and, and ways that remote work can be done more effectively. What are some of the things um, over, your, over the years and your experience you find really contribute to an effective remote work situation? Yeah, I appreciate you calling out the fact, Kristen, that this isn't um, you know, a normal sort of situation where we're transitioning to remote work, you know, a lot of organizations uh, are definitely adjusting to this uh, situation sort of as, as much as they can, but in a pretty, uh, you know, forceful, quick fashion. And I think that's important to recognize because I've sort of likened it to we've all been kind of white knuckling our way through the last month or so with remote work and a lot of what happens uh, when that quick switch occurs is that we just translate our usual ways of working in, in office through now distance and like mediated by technology. And, and so there isn't really like a thoughtful, deliberative approach to thinking about, hey, how can we effectively collaborate um, with distributed teams and distributed decision making? And so I'm hoping, uh, as I think all of us, you know, speaking from the end of April, see that this is going to stretch out for a while, uh, are able to now step back as we're getting into a little bit more of a routine and think about, okay, what is working about how we're, how we're doing this and what isn't? 
Yeah. And one, one of the things that I think Kristen's really common when people move to remote work and just translate existing ways of working is that they fail to take into account some of the, the pretty predictable challenges that remote work involves, like the lack of context yeah. that we all have. Because in an office, you've got that ambient kind of information that you're getting from the environment. You overhear people talking, you run into people in the elevator or you know, in the kitchen, kitchenette. Um, and we don't have that now. So there's a lot of blank canvas. Yes. And people fill that blank canvas, you know, a natural human tendency, we tell stories to ourselves. And so some of those stories, especially at a time like this, where there's so much uncertainty um, and really scary stuff happening in the world, we can tell ourselves pretty negative stories. So there is a tendency, I think, for people to um, misinterpret uh, communication that they're getting from other people, particularly in writing, like if you're using instant message or email, we tend to ascribe more negative connotations to the messages we're getting. So misunderstandings and conflict can occur, but we also can really um, get into our own heads uh, about some of the anxieties that we normally have, but that are really magnified by being alone at home, staring into a computer screen and having a lot of this blank canvas to fill. So those are all things I think people really need to attend to right now. Yeah, I think you brought up something that's incredibly important right now, and that's the, the we're really hungering for the human connection, right? We're used to, like, I, I'm a hugger by nature, so I, I'm missing my hugs, and my kids and my husband are like, can you stop hugging me? Because there's, there's lots of hugging happening, but in general, right? And, and even if you're not a hugger, we're used, we're, we're used to having a lot of human connection, even with strangers, right? You go order your coffee from Starbucks, you're seeing that person, they might even recognize you, hey, Jane, you, they know your order, right? All of these different things, these micro moments that happen throughout our day, we're missing out on some of those. So it's so important from a human connection perspective, maybe sometimes it's not sending the email and it's not doing a text and it might not feel as efficient, but it is actually picking up the phone um, and having a a quick dialogue uh, for that conversation. And as you're saying that, and this is going a little further to the other extreme, but I think it's important that we bring this up right now um, with, with sometimes layoffs happening right now. And, and I get it. Sometimes it's just, it's in, it, there's nothing that can be done about it in some situations and some, there could be alternatives, but some there aren't. And um, it, it, it's so important to be very compassionate and empathetic and human in the way those conversations are happening. Uh, I just had a, a friend of a friend share an experience yesterday where she was let go from a position she'd had for 20 years um, via email. Wow. Yeah, I just don't think there's any excuse for that. Um, it's, it's really hard. I mean, um, you know, in my past uh, positions. I worked for a fully remote company for a couple of years, and um, and we did. We were in, we were a startup, and as is the case with startups, there are ups and downs as as you work through, um, you know, figuring out your your product market fit. And we did have to do layoffs, and because we were fully remote, we had people in four countries. Um, we did those layoffs remotely, and I know something that I talk about a lot when I when I speak about remote work is that remote you have to start with a mindset shift and where we started when we thought about as a company that wanted to be transparent, that wanted to be empathetic, you know, what is the right way to approach uh, those situations where you do have to let somebody go remotely. And, um, you know, at that organization, we had some pretty intense talks about it as a leadership team. And we decided you really had to start with the end in mind, which meant that you had to be even more transparent than, Uh, you would be in a normal day-to-day office environment well before termination was even a thought in your mind because uh, people needed to know where they stand. You had to take out some of um, that lack of contact, that blank canvas. So you needed to have really, really adult-to-adult conversations with people about how they were doing uh, so that when and if a decision had to be made about termination, uh, people knew the state of the nation with the organization, and they knew the state of the nation with respect to their performance. So in either of those scenarios, whether it was caused by, you know, a situation with the organization or, or with the, um, you know, the individuals sort of fit with their role, that when you sat down to have a conversation with somebody via video, it wasn't a shock. It wasn't a surprise. And you were able yes. to do that in an empathetic way. 
Yeah, that's such a good point, right? What it, what is that? What what was that dialogue that could have? What are those conversations that could have had uh, have been happening a long time before that, so that that person is prepared for what those possibilities might might look like? And and Jane, I know you've talked some other times about there's also those ways to create community and connection when you're not in the office. And I remember you um, talking about something where it would be like on Fridays there was something that you would do, and and sometimes it's like we think, oh, it needs to be all business. Well, no, like <laughs> we need. To to connect human to human and that sometimes through through fun through play through um, doing things that have absolutely nothing to do with work because then we get to know that person on a deeper level so what were some of those things I know you personally did in the organization that you worked with but some of those recommendations you have to still continue with some of that team building while people are remote yeah I can definitely talk about that and I think you know the added the added layer of what all of us are experiencing right now is important to acknowledge as well, because I don't know about you, Kristen, but I, um, I can be a bit of a curmudgeon and I really hate forced fun when it feels like inauthentic. And I know, yes. you know that, that you're all about authenticity. So I know that that's not something that you would want to ever suggest. I think, you know, there are fun things to do for team building now. And it's also so important to make space for people to share how they are genuinely feeling. Um, and that is also team building, right? So some of the things I know that are fun that we've done in the past and that my team is doing now even. Um, so in, in a past organization, I, I, you know, I started, I think it was called uh, Team Trivia Tuesday. And I would ask people like a question that was pretty, you know, low risk for people to share, like, what was your favorite um, Halloween costume? Or what did you get in trouble for when you were a kid? Um, and, and it was great. People would, you know, end up sharing, in fact, at some points, like funny pictures of terrible haircuts their parents gave them. Like, <laughs> I would have one of those. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we really, like, I haven't come across somebody yet who did not. Um, one of the things my team is doing right now is we are doing a couple of like weekly social standups in the morning, just like 30 minutes um, to check in and not talk about work. And we started, I don't even know how it started, but we started doing show and tell on Wednesdays. So people are in their homes and they're like, some of us have like lots of stuff. Some people like me, I'm like running out. I'm like, here is a lamp that, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> but it's actually a really fun little window into where all of us are physically at the moment. And as I mentioned, I think it's super important for people to be able to say, I'm having a really terrible day right now. And here's the things that are on my mind. Um, so being able to do both of those things and have that range within your team, I think really shows a lot of trust um, and gives us an opportunity to make sure people don't feel like they have to put on a brave face if they're not feeling that way in a given moment. So important. And it reminds me of a client was doing something similar to you with MTV Cribs. And, and even with the, when they started and showing that everyone was showing their, their areas. And it's interesting that as they started to continue this, because it's been going on for the last month, um, people would step forward and they have more ideas, right? So it's not that the leaders telling them this is what it is involving uh -huh. them. And it's been this, um, it's been cool to watch it e evolve. Uh, but I think the other point that is critical that you've shared is that there needs to be um, continuous one-on-one -on -one conversation around how are you doing in this moment? Um, how can I support you? Uh, just having that, that, that space to be able to share and the leaders as well being part of that, right? Hey, I'm having a hard time too. This is what yesterday looked like for me. Um, I think sometimes there's this belief and, and it does exist in some cultures as well, which I know it can be difficult uh, where the leaders feel like, oh, I have to be the, the I have to be the one that's always, um, the leader that's the visionary that we can get through this it's champion and everything and it's like you're a human just like everybody else and let's give everyone else permission through you sharing authentically and vulnerably yeah i agree and i think that if you can do that as a team as well not just one-on-one -on -one, like that yes. really speaks to an incredible level of psychological safety so something that is not um you know, uh, new or even like specific to my team, but my organization, um, and, you know, and my team as people practices, we do a lot of learning and development and workshops internally. Um, and the, the organization is very much a, a learning culture that way. And something that we use throughout is uh, the mood meter, which um, comes from the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and basically has you know, the four quadrants that speak to different um, layer, different layers and levels of 
emotions and it's yeah. a tool to basically help you um, increase your emotional granularity. So your ability to pinpoint what you're feeling and to, um, to get better at recognizing how that's influencing you, how you show up, but also, you know, how you can shift out of those emotions if they're not useful in that moment. Yeah. Um, and, and we use that in all of our workshops and it's actually something that's used quite broadly in the organization. So we also use that as a language to communicate how we're feeling, right? So the, the quadrants have colors. So sometimes, yeah. you know, people are like, I'm a high red right now. You know that they're yeah. super anxious. And that is, yeah. that's become part of our lexicon within my team yeah. and the broader organization, which is super helpful because it gives you shared language to talk about how you're feeling. I think that is incredible. Um, just even as you were saying that, it reminds me of what we're experiencing at home with our little guy, who's our spirited guy. And we talk about if he's in the green or the yellow or the red zone, right? And so there's times where we say, whoa, he's in the yellow zone. Like we need to act fast right now, right? What do we need to best support him? For him as our seven-year-old, he's just experiencing intense emotions. Can't necessarily articulate it the same as adults can, but we'll recognize us as a family, my husband and my daughter and say, okay, we're in the yellow zone right now we know we need to work together right now to to support him right or he's, he's already in the red zone we recognize that this isn't a time we're going to start to have a conversation he can't hear anything we're saying right he's not um so i think anytime you have that that language it just breaks it down right it creates a framework that everyone can um can come together and understand again it's okay it's normal we've i've had so many conversations this week around anger and why anger is okay. And it's, it's so interesting how much we judge ourselves for having what we consider the bad emotions that we're not supposed mm -hmm. to have. These are the okay emotions. These ones over here, we're not supposed to have those. Then I guess we don't get to be human then because it comes with being a human. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things we talk a lot about um, when we do run workshops about this stuff is that every, like all emotions can be useful in the right context. So, you know, I always give the example. So in the, the mood meter um, that we use, you know, the blue quadrant is the quadrant that's associated with feeling more like reflective and, and sometimes sad. Um, you know, and I give an example when I deliver that workshop and I say, if I, as, you know, as a people partner and people are coming to me to talk about sometimes challenging situations that they might be in, whether it's related to their career development or a conflict they're having or a challenge that they're not able to overcome in their work. If I showed up feeling like super optimistic and happy and jazzed at all times, I think that it would be very difficult for me to display the kind of empathy that's needed that people are going to feel like I'm hearing them and I'm truly understanding how this is impacting them. And so sometimes having that sort of that, that blue, like sad, reflective, being able to tune into that is actually really, really helpful and necessary. Um, likewise, you know, when people are doing their work and they're having to think about, you know, we work in life sciences, so thinking about patients and how people experience certain disease conditions, being able to empathize is critical to design work. Um, so we talk a lot about, there are no bad emotions. There are things that are more or less useful to the situation that you're in, and you need to be able to sort of not be just in it and experiencing it, but putting it outside yourself. So, you know, if you want to get all like nerdy and, and theoretical, which I do, uh, you know, you think about Keegan, uh, Robert Keegan, and thinking about subject object theory, right? So taking something that is a subject that you are subject to, it's the water you're swimming in as a fish and being able to label it and put it outside yourself, making it an object that you can actually examine, explore, reflect on, and potentially like act on and shift out of if it's not useful. Mm -hmm. Like that is absolutely critical to development as, as a human, as a leader, as um, you know, anybody who wants to be an effective self manager as well. Yeah, I talk a lot about this. It's giving, and, and sometimes it's just about giving it that space, right? Instead of rushing out, because a lot of times people will push the emotions down, right? So to give some space to be able to be curious and what's coming up right now, what's the story, getting curious. And then a lot of times you're, once you've done that and you give it that space, you can actually pull yourself out of it. And a lot of times it only actually takes a minute and a half for that emotion to work its way through, but we have to give it that space to be able to release it. And like you said, a lot of times it's because of the story that's actually creating the feelings and starts with the thoughts that then become those feelings and emotions and then result in actions. But when we start to pause, then we can re re respond instead of reacting. Um, 
So Jane, this, this podcast is called Inspirational Leadership. And when I talk about inspirational leadership for me, that's around defining what does that look like to show up as the best version of yourself when, as a leader. And to me, leaders are always growing and developing and that's never going to be done. But when you think about someone who's showing up as a, an inspirational leader and those characteristics around the, the leaders you would like to see in workplaces, what does that look like for you? What are some of those behaviors and characteristics? Yeah, I think it's a great question and it's been shifting a lot for me um, in the last year or so. So one of the things that um, has taken up a lot of my time and attention uh, in the last year is that I'm also completing a master's program that's focused on human systems intervention, which is about change in human systems, whether that's an organization or a team or, or a community. And I think that that examination, um, which uh, involves a lot of reflection on my own mental models and my own assumptions and the own narratives that I've sort of absorbed in my life and my career, um, there is this real, uh, this real um, propensity, I think, in our sort of modern day work culture to, to really lionize um, leaders as heroes. Mm -hmm. And to have this view that leaders should have answers, um, that they should be kind of what you were saying to a few moments ago, that they should have this brave face and that we turn to them for answers. And, and I, I think more and more I'm realizing how um, dysfunctional that can be in, in certain environments, um, particularly in environments as we are right now that are fast changing and that are unprecedented as much as that word is overused right yes, now, but really, you know, there, it, there, it is filled with complexity and uncertainty. Um, and in environments like that, more and more, I'm coming to believe that leaders that, you know, I might describe as inspirational, but leaders who are, who are effective and who are um, positive forces in their communities are ones who invite um, participatory uh, leadership from all levels and who are uh, championing um, voices that are marginalized and who yes. are willing to see themselves as part of the system that they're in and therefore contributing, um, whether they intend to or not, to the dynamics and patterns that exist in those, those groups, uh, whether it's a team or an organization or a community or a family. And so uh, really being willing to step back and think about how am I contributing to the results and the behaviors that I'm seeing around me um, for good or, or not? And what am I not seeing? What am I not hearing? Who is not at the table? Like that to me is, is becoming so apparent uh, in our current crisis, uh, like broadly in society and government, but, but also in organizations that are facing you know, new challenges that none of us have a playbook for. Yeah, that's and that really brings me to the some of the, the the questions I wanted to ask you around inclusive leadership. And um, I think even from before we get into inclusive leadership, I think it'd be helpful for you to share a little bit around the Aperta project and um, what your what your goal was in, in in doing that. Yeah, thank you. I always love the opportunity to talk about this, as you know. Um, so the Aperta project, uh, the shorter version is um, that this sort of was borne out by the Me Too movement, which uh, you know, had a, a, a resurgence. Of course, Me Too was a hashtag created by Toronto Burke um, and a movement focused on, um, on, on supporting victims uh, of sexual and gender-based violence. But um, you know, more recently, sort of after some of the stories that emerged in 2017 in the media about some of the uh, continued um, prevalence of sexual harassment and violence in organizations. Um, I, I really started thinking about like, how do I, as, as an HR professional, mm -hmm. as, a, as a leader in some ways in, in the organizations I've been part of, how, how am I contributing to the perpetuation of this problem? How am I contributing to the status quo? And so, yeah, I embarked on, um, you know, a bit of a journey with research and talking to a lot of people who do work in this space. Uh, which led me to establish the Aperta Project, which is just a side project. It's an initiative that was focused on helping uh, decision makers, whether they were leaders or uh, managers or HR professionals, to understand the gap between how we conceive of the problem of sexual harassment, which is as an individual like problem of bad apples, not knowing how to act, 
bridging that gap between how it's actually experienced by individuals in organizations, which is often an experience that is marked by um, a whole array of toxic behaviors that have been allowed to fester in organizations that ultimately it can lead to the, the rise of this kind of behavior. And then subsequently, the feelings often of betrayal and uh, re-victimization that can occur when people seek out help in their organizations, or sometimes when they don't seek out help because they are already convinced that they can't trust the organizational processes that are in place to, to address this problem. So it's shifting from this sort of linear causality, like, oh, it's a bad apple problem and it's, you know, it's not about us, to saying, how are we as organizations contributing to this issue and how can we actually move from being reactive after it happens to prevention. Yes. Yes. And I think this is so important and I, uh, I'm so happy for the way you're speaking about this Jane and, and shifting the dialogue because I think it was, um, like you said, it was too reactive and, and not getting back, back to the root cause. So I'm kind of getting tired of band-aids and I like to get more at the root cause, right? What are the micro behaviors that are happening that get to that in the first place, right? So, um, and I know it's not going to be an easy answer because there's many things that need to happen. Uh, but there's people who could be watching right now and it's a starting point, right? So if you were going to start to talk to organizations and say, what are some of those things that they need to do to be more cognizant of those micro behaviors and start to make those shifts? What are some of the recommendations you would make? Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm really, I can definitely talk about some things that I think are, are clearly apparent. Um, but I, I will say, and I do say a lot, like we don't have clear answers or solutions to this problem. It is a complex problem. Yes. Um, and so I, I do really want to shift out of, cause what I find is like, people are really addicted to solutions. Like, okay, tell me the three things that I need to do. Give me a yeah. listicle. And I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> uh, that's part of the issue. Right. Yeah. But I think that there are clearly things that, um, that the research is already telling us that, that this is, you know, there's a researcher has been working on this for, for decades and uh, they point to the fact that um, what, what really gives rise to the kinds of uh, you know, dysfunctional and abusive behaviors that lead to things like sexual harassment, which is often co-occurring with bullying um, and rampant incivility in organizations. So uh, it is about the culture that exists. And culture um, is often, I think, you know, uh, viewed as this kind of thing that we can design, that we can decide on um, in an organization. And, and it just doesn't work that way. But culture is an outcome. Culture is the result of all of the behaviors and interactions that occur in our organization. So what I talk about to leaders is think about everything that you reward and encourage in your organization, but also that you tolerate or ignore. Mm. or that you don't even notice because it's so prosaic, like some of the biased behaviors that have been baked into how we do things um, in traditional organizations, that those things also contribute to your culture. And so if you're just focusing on what you want and thinking like, oh, you know, that interaction that I just occurred, that just occurred in this meeting, and it doesn't really rise to the threshold of being sexual harassment. So I'm not going to do anything about it. You are baking that into your culture. And so that momentary decision can have lots of ripple effects down the road. So, so that sort of gives you a little bit of context. And, and so to come back to your question and try to answer a bit more clearly about what needs to happen. Well, we need to, first of all, have a very clear understanding at a, at a leader level about why harassment occurs, that we have control as um, individuals every day at all levels in the organization of the kind of culture that gets produced, but we have to attend to how we're interacting with people um, day to day. It can't just be about this uh, behavior that breaches a certain legal threshold. We need to yes. be attending things way before then. Um, and so that means being reflective about how we are in every action that we take, uh, either contributing to a status quo um, or really driving a more inclusive and trusting organization. Because uh, what the research tells us is that leaders who are unequivocally um, and very publicly talking about how they will not tolerate um, abusive behavior, biased behavior, 
uh, bullying, those things can really make a difference. If we don't say anything and we assume that, well, we only hire good people, so that won't happen here, we're not actually taking the steps that we need to, to be really public about what will not be tolerated. And then we need to, of course, back up those words mm -hmm. with actions, which mm -hmm. means that there needs to be um, not just response to complaints, because about 70% of sexual harassment complaints go unreported in organizations. We need to be publicly sometimes uh, addressing behavior that falls short of a high standard that we want to set, which means um, saying to somebody, I notice that you keep interrupting your female colleagues in every meeting that we have, and that's yeah. not okay. That's not an inclusive behavior. We need to change that. And it starts with that. People think, oh, that's something small, but it absolutely contributes to a culture that ultimately is more likely to give rise to harassment. And it also contributes to a culture in which uh, someone who might be a target of harassment is sitting there thinking, well, if they're not going to call out something small, they're clearly not going to support me if I report sexual harassment and therefore mm. I'm not going to. And so it, 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 it perpetuates and it continues because we, we can't solve things that we don't see. It's so important for, like you're saying, that victim who's seeing it, they don't have that psychological safety or trust. So they're just thinking there's no point. I'm not going to get the support or, or they're going to be victimized again and they know what it looks like in that organization. So why would they want to put themselves through that? But I think the other thing that you've pointed to where we all take responsibility and I can think of situations where that happened. I can think of myself as a child where I saw some bullying and I was the bystander. Well, it doesn't change when you're in the workplace and you're also the bystander gender. Um, bullying can be those micro behaviors, right? So it, to me, there's a, an opportunity for everybody listening to this right now. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're an HR leader, you don't need to be a leader. And by the way, I think we're all leaders. It's just about a title. Uh, we all have an opportunity to show up as, as leaders and model the behaviors you want to, um, for others to, to, to also be, be using. Um, is to have those courageous, bold conversations and say that what, what just happened there was not acceptable. To, it's, it's really, really, really important. And, and, and I can think of times where it might have, again, been smaller that I could have used my voice in that moment. And, 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 and again, we're all, we all can take responsibility. Yeah, there is, um, and I'm, I'm going to mix them up. There's two, there's, there's lots of amazing researchers out there on this. And I, there's two that are called Jennifer and I'm going to mix them up. So it's either Jennifer Freight or Jennifer Birdall. But one of them speaks about the idea that, you know, the training that we've typically done, the approaches that we've typically taken to this issue in organizations, it, and, and it actually is not just for this issue, is this very rationalist approach, right? Well, we'll just need to tell people not to do this. And we just need to tell people that if it does happen, they should report it. But it really ignores the reality of how this stuff actually occurs and how people actually experience it. Um, and so one of the Jennifers, the Dr. Uh, Freud or Birdall talks about, instead we need to appeal to the reasonable majority. So we actually need to look at the vast number of people in our organizations that don't want this behavior to occur and are not going to perpetuate this behavior, but who yeah. typically stand by because they don't know how to intervene and they don't know if the organization will support them if they do. And so yes. that's really a huge lever for us to be focused on in organizations. And absolutely, it speaks to what you just said, which is that all of us have a part to play. All of us perpetuate and contribute and cultivate culture in our organization through our behavior and interactions. So we all have that responsibility. Um, but yeah, it really is this, this, uh, this sort of addiction we have in organizations to this rationalist linear approach where we're like, well, if we just tell people not to do things, like just write a policy about it. Right. Um, and that's not how things actually work. And we can, yeah. we know that, right. We look at um, the way that, that people actually behave in, in real life and, and it's so much more complex uh, than that. And so, you know, shifting out of that uh, mentality is, is really tough. But one of the things I talk about a lot is there's been a couple of studies done about how targets of harassment typically respond. And they use a whole variety of coping strategies. And one of the very last ones is formally reporting it. Because yeah. if you think about being in a situation, if you've ever been in a situation where you've been bullied or where you've been harassed or where you've... Um, experience that kind of um, that kind of behavior that's uh, that's directed at you in either a workplace or in a school group or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know that you largely try to manage it. You try to either like 
bridge the gap with the person and like make them see you as more of a human being. Yeah. You try to avoid them. There's all of these coping strategies. And that's actually very rational when you get right down to it and you can put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's experiencing it. Yeah. So, you know, this whole idea of like, well, we have a zero tolerance policy and, and like that isn't enough. We actually need to deal with the reality of how people um, experience this and, 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 and act in organizations in day-to-day -day life, which was, you know, my goal with the Aperta project, I did a Toronto tech study with some collaborators in the UK um, trying to collect first person stories of how their harassment um, was experienced to really get at the complexities of what that looks like when you're uh, when you're in somebody's shoes. So as anyone, everyone can hear right now, Jane is so filled with wisdom and I'm, I'm so thankful for you to be here today and share this with everyone. And I encourage everyone to check out Talent Vanguard because um, Jane has some really poignant conversations and, and does constantly challenge the status quo and, and encourage us to take a step back and look at things in different ways. Um, I'll include all of that in the show notes. I always like to give my guests an opportunity to have a final thought, Jane. What's the final thought you would like to leave with the audience? So an, uh, a piece of advice that I'm trying to take myself right now and that I've been giving to people um, while we're in this kind of strange limbo period, while we are waiting for the far shore post-pandemic to come into view is, um, is just that this is an opportunity for us to deeply notice what is happening in our organizations and in our communities. And I know for HR professionals, it's, it's so common that we're running from one thing to another and reacting and, and supporting others. And so I've, I've urged people to really try to capture um, as best they can some observations and reflections about what's going on in their organization and to talk to as many people um, as possible because it, it might not feel groundbreaking in that moment, but it really can help us sort of sense into what's happening in our organizations and communities. So yeah, slow down. Um, I, I always say like, you know, be, be the anthropologist of your organization. Yes. Uh, and so that's, that's my sort of parting comment, mostly to myself, but also to us. <laughs> Some great advice. And I know that that's how you approach it, approach both work and life, Jane. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Kristen. It was great speaking with you. Have a wonderful day, everyone.